Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome, everyone, to our webinar for today, Professionalizing the Community Schemes Management Industry. Um, we are joined today by Zalinda van der Merwe, Vita Wilkins, and Billy Ruiz. Um, I'm just going to do a quick poll, and then we will continue, and I'll introduce our three speakers. There we go. It's just a one question poll. Um. Okay. Okay, super. We'll end the poll there. Um, thank you very much. Super. We have majority managing agents for the day. Um, okay, just to introduce our speakers. Um, sorry. I'm just starting with Billy Ruiz. Uh, Billy has practiced as a property attorney for over 20 years. He was involved in sectional title management for over eight years, where he dealt with various municipal bills and interacted extensively with local municipalities. Billy started Stratafin in 2014 with the goal of assisting bodies corporate with their funding without catching them in a debt trap. Stratafin strives to be a fair and equitable money provider for the sectional title industry. Uh, Zalinda van der Merwe. Zalinda is a specialist community schemes consultant offering the services of legal advice in the form of consultations and legal opinions, meeting and CSOS attendance, government, sorry, governance documentation review and amendment, as well as being a professional trustee. Zalinda's background is that she is an owner and resident in an HOA and an investor owner in sectional title schemes, a previous managing agent and practicing attorney. Zalinda lives and breathes community scheme living and loves it. And Vita Wilkins is our new guest speaker for the day. Vita is an admitted attorney, notary and conveyancer, and also a full-time lecturer at the Department of Construction Economics at the University of Pretoria. She is the program leader, leader for the BSc in Honours in BSc Real Estate, Property Science and the MSc Real Estate degrees at the department. She is also a non-executive director of NAMA, tasked with the registration of NAMA as a professional body, as well as the development of SACWA registered qualifications for community scheme managers. Welcome everyone and we look forward to today's session. Thanks guys. Um... Billy, really? you're mute. Why does every webinar start with Billy? You're mute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm speaking over Lauren's microphone here, and I hear myself, so I didn't think I was muted. So, so the discussion regarding professionalization of the community schemes industry started one night in the middle of the night with Gary from BCM, Gary Engelbrecht from BCM. Track, uh, writing um, some um, comments on sectional title managers, um, South Africa, uh, or portfolio manager support group, um, South Africa. And um, I was 
up that night and we started communicating. And then at some stage, I thought, let me start writing something about this and discussing this and see where this goes, because it's a very, very interesting topic and something that definitely has to happen in the industry. Um, so, yeah, so, so I, I started and I've got 12 slides here. Um, we, we're going to not stay with the slides. We're going to have a discussion. Um, so we're going to chat about this. Um, but I do want to use this, uh, the 12 slides as the structure basically surrounding the different aspects that I think are the important things. But those are just my thoughts. I'm not um, an expert. Um, and that's why we've got uh, Vita here. She is tasked with this um, at NAMA, um, and she is dealing with this extensively and also at the University of Pretoria dealing with it extensively. Um, Zerlinda and uh, Hendrik Hoffman made some comments um, also on sectional title living South Africa uh, regarding this topic, and I thought it's important that we also get them involved in, in this discussion and see where this goes. So I think the introduction was that um, the, the industry is growing exponentially. We are seeing a huge growth in respect of sectional title schemes. And um, there's also a huge growth of um, sectional title managers um, and people that want to enter the industry. Um, I attended a, a PPRA and CISOS um, function last week in Johannesburg. And there were about 40 new um, people that wanted to become executive managing agents and managing agents. So a huge amount of people that want to enter the industry. And I think that the most important thing that I thought was that there should be some or other minimal um, or minimum um, educational standard and there should be some ethical standards. I thought that that is the start. Um, but I think let's start with Vita, um, and, and Vita, maybe you can um, just uh, tell us quickly how uh, these things start and how you professionalize and so forth from your point of view. Thank you, Billy. So when I did my master's dissertation, I did it on the professionalization of the sectional title industry. And... Um, Part of my research was how the Australians uh, do this, the Malaysians, pretty much the, 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 the jurisdictions that share the same platform as ours, meaning strata title in New South Wales. And I had to look at what a profession is and all those things. So maybe to, to start this discussion, we're talking about professionalism professionalization is to indicate what we mean by the word profession, what is a profession um, and how it came about. And uh, it's actually fairly simple in the sense that it has to do with, are we on equal footing with knowledge? Um, if we both go to the supermarket and we want to buy potatoes, we are fairly well versed in potatoes. So we can make our decision on potatoes, buy it and uh, pay for it and go home and cook it. But if I go to the doctor or to the engineer or to the attorney or to the architect, name all the professions or the uh, chartered accountant, and I am not a medical person or I'm not a legal person or I'm not an engineer, then the assumption is that I am not on the same footing as that professional person. So I can't make an informed decision because I just not know the same things that that person know. Hence, professional, um, profession, and also then where the regulation of these professions came from to safeguard the fact that knowledge that these people have are on a certain level and that if I go to a doctor that is registered by law with the Health Professionals Council, um, who if you want to register with the Health Professional Council, you had to achieve your degree at a recognized tertiary institution with that board, you can then assume that the knowledge that that person uh, got during their studies is on a certain standard 
and you can believe in the knowledge that that person has. Merely for the fact that you didn't do the same, you didn't study the same. Same with legal people and all of that. So a profession is where there's um, specialized knowledge unique to that specific industry. So professionalization then would be where that you, where you put yourself on a certain level in your industry where you have special, specialized knowledge and where the people in your community that needs to make use of your services can make the assumption that if you are of a certain level and accredited with a certain regulatory or voluntary organization, that you have a unique skill set and then they can believe in the skill set that you have. And then very importantly, and because we have a majority of managing agents in the audience, uh, to be remunerated for your specialized knowledge. Um, nobody, well, they do complain, but they still pay it when you go to a medical specialist or you have to get an MRI scan for 15,000 rand or something like that, because you know it's a doctor and it's a professional. If you want to get divorced, you go to an attorney and you pay the money to get rid of whoever you don't like anymore. It's specialized uh, skills and knowledge. Um, in our profession, so, sorry, Vita, um, can I just, Zerlinda, I want to bring you in here because I think this is your point that you and Hendrik Hoffman um, made in respect of this. So, Vita, we'll, we'll come back to you right now, but mm. I just think I want to bring uh, Zerlinda in here regarding that specific point regarding remuneration. Sure, sure. So, I mean, yes, we always complain about all sorts of things, Vita, not only the, the medical professionals, but the legal practitioners as well. But unfortunately, we reach the point that we have to pay them because we need them as a professional. Now, um, Hendrik wrote an article for us that we posted in our September um, newsletter. It's on our website, recognizing the value of managing agents, six ways to advance the profession. And one of the first things that he starts off with, he says, when he entered the industry in 2007, the average management fee was 69 Rand a unit. After 16 years, our current fee stands at 95 Rand a unit. And he believes that um, the average management fee should be no less than 170 Rand per unit. He speaks about charging for after hours meetings, fair compensation for emergency availability, fair reimbursement for travel expenses. I mean, when it comes to, to being a managing agent, unfortunately, the body corporates and the homeowners associations and other types of schemes have, uh, have very... Um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, not very deep pockets, or they're very, very stringent when it comes to what they're willing to pay for. And I think this mentality of the per unit rate and the minimum fees uh, need to come to an end. There's also a very big undercutting in the industry. We were chatting about it amongst ourselves as a team this morning uh, in preparation for the webinar. And we were speaking about even the managing agent colleagues that we have, you know, the one will offer a flat rate with no additional services. The other will charge a very low management fee, but a whole list of additional services. The other one will charge a low rate and not charge for additional services, even though they have it. I'm not saying that there needs to be a set fee, but there needs to be a little bit of comparing apples with apples, in my opinion, um, but there needs to be a better reimbursement for actual services delivered. I don't know if that is if is, is what you're looking for, Vinny. Yeah, sure. Um, so that that is absolutely uh, important. Um, so what I also said here, there are um, some challenges. I mean, high expectations. So people expect managing agents to do the world, um, but low remuneration. So... Um, don't want to pay for what, what they do. Um, but then there's also a problem that there is a lack of skilled and trained personnel in the industry. And we see that often um, that, that people, I mean, and from our point of view, where we do due diligence prior to us doing our debt purchase model, um, we have not, and Aubrey and I, I mean, we've, we've gone through the country uh, doing the let's get physical with user Linda. And I mean, uh, he says it and us. I've never seen a, a scheme that's compliant, neither have my compliance team ever seen a, a scheme that is compliant in terms of the act. Um, so people don't do things in the way that it should be done. Um, and 
that that is also something that 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 goes to pro, to professionalism and if you're then entitled to those fees and so forth. And then I'm saying also there's low ethical standards. I mean, we also see that that people ask for kickbacks. People ask for for um, for a por portion of the amount that is going to for the new wall that's going to be built and the electric fencing and those sort of things. So I think those things are also part of professionalization and part of of the whole thing, but definitely um, in respect of that. So um, Vita, oh, you've, yes. you've 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 spoken about of, of uh, education and you, I think in, before we started, you were speaking about the level of education in QF4, in QF5. Um, so um, maybe, maybe also let's have a chat about training. What, what training should there be for professionalization and so forth? Um, I just want to go back to uh, the remuneration. And that is something that um, Donny van der Merwe, sorry, don't want to, yeah, yeah. Specific service providers, but but that, that is a very uh, fascinating philosophy that Danny van der Merwe of WeConnect you have, and he, he he presents it in his in his presentations where he says, um, it's all about a, 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 a mentality of where they they did some research and where service provision of managing agents is of a high standard. There interestingly is enough enough, not a problem to pay for it. You you would have seen that graph of his where it goes in Cape Town 170 yeah. or something like that. So yeah. on remuneration, I mean that is the old adage. If if the service is of a high standard, then I don't have a problem to pay for it. My opinion about that aspect in our community is the community schemes industry is two pronged. The one is, and, and, and I'm getting to the education. The one is the absolute upskilling of our community scheme portfolio managers and the managing agents on the one hand, but on the other hand, the responsibility of trustees and for that matter, all owners and occupiers of sectional title scheme to upskill themselves as well. And then to go one step further and to say, I, I, I'm, I've told this to you and Sir Linda, I'm also on that uh, sectional title group on Facebook. And sometimes I just scroll past it because I can't read it. Uh, I, get, I get anxiety to see what is going on on that group where um, there's a fixation on the act and can we do this and can we do that instead of uh, interest in resolving the dispute, maybe by sitting around a table. And I know those things are difficult, but um, I'm of the opinion if my owners and occupiers know more, my trustees know more, um, they will be in a position to make a better assessment on which managing agent to choose and not necessarily the cheapest one because they will be in a position to make an informed decision. So your managing agent that comes to the party that charges the 20 or the 30 or the 40 rand more, but they come with certain skills will be in the better position because the people that decides to sign the service level agreement with that institution will have a knowledge of what these people are bringing to the table and also be in a position to assess that they are actually delivering the service. Bringing us to education and qualifications. Uh, a proper qualification to my mind is that thing that you can hang against the wall. How do you know the thing that you hang against the wall is a proper qualification? You make sure that that qualification is registered with SAKWA, which is the South African Quality Assurance Council. Oh, that the stuff that, is that the stuff that hangs behind Zerlinda's um, that, head? Those there? things, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I, th I thought you were supposed to just lick the signatures to see if it's uh, if it's real. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and uh, if if I can educate the, the the audience, all 
So all learning institutions needs to be registered with SACWA. All degrees at the University of Pretoria needs to be registered with SACWA. Um, we have three different um, councils regulating um, training, which is Umalusi for, for, for school up to matric. Then we have the QCTO for your um, occupations and skills. And then you have the Council for the Higher Education, which are your tertiary institutions. And all those present qualifications that needs to be registered with SACWA. Now, we, we being the community scheme industry, currently do not have a qualification like that. And for years, um, portfolio managers were forced to write the um, exam at the old EAAB, now the PPRA, which was specifically focused at estate agents. Um, I went through that manual and there was nothing specifically relating to the complex issue that is the complexes we live in. I'm, I live in a complex myself. Um, and that is crucial for an industry to have qualifications because that gives you a career path and it gives you a designation within your industry. Now, the good news is, well, first of all, if you uh, have a child, any of you in the audience that has have a child that's got doing well in maths, doing well in science and or accounting, you can enroll that child for a degree at either UCT WITS or Pretoria um, in property science. That is sort of like first place. And then you can enter the industry. For the rest, there's nothing. And the exciting thing is that NAMA, and I'll get to NAMA and the role it plays. NAMA are um, the huge work with the PPRA and the CSOS, where we are at the point that the application is into the QCTO to develop um, at this stage, NQF5 and NQF4 qualification specifically aimed at community scheme managers. So that will be a proper paper to hang against the wall. Um, one step further is the fact that the uh, professional designated exam that needs to be written at the PPRA will be in um, parts where if you are an auctioneer, you will write a part B that is specifically aimed at auctioneers. If you are a community scheme manager, you will do that. So the PDE exam will also be modified that industry specific people will write industry specific uh, parts in the PDE exam. And I think that is very exciting for everybody to understand that that is in the pipeline. And how that process works is once the QCTO agrees with the qualification, then we need to get the industry experts together. That's important for you and to learn to know that you can prepare yourselves. Um, uh, uh, the services CETA regulations require that you then get the industry together and there's a decision on curriculum and content. And then the, uh, the, 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 the qualification gets developed. It gets registered with the SAC, with SACWA and then it can be presented by recognized learning institutions. So, so, and on that point, it might sound very exciting to me seeing the value in that, but I remember when the NQ4 and 5 for the estate agents were um, implemented, I think it was around about 2010, thereabouts, there were a lot of resistance from people who didn't want to do it. I've been an estate agent for 20 years. Why do I need to do this? Why do I say this? I say this, you can't on the one hand argue professionalization of your industry and being in a position to charge more and on the other hand, be resistant to change, uh, not wanting to get the qualification and to get into the stream, this pipeline of, of, of uplifting the skills in your community. You have to, yeah. Yes, oh, there you go. Um, 
Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, so when we start having this training, on what level um, should this be? Um, so, Linda, what is your what is your thought? Um, do you think people do require um, education on on the level of of university degrees, or do you think that a lower level, like an NQF five, uh, would be would be sufficient? What's your What's your feeling? So I actually, I had this very um, discussion with Matthew, Nicole, Nell and Nicole Tavares this morning. Um, Matthew and myself were both very fortunate that we stepped into being managing agents directly out of university, both with our LLB degrees and all those fun things. And I asked him in his opinion, you know, what does he think that he's university level education um, brought to the table. And I do think that a law degree is a relevant degree uh, for the purposes of the question. And, you know, interestingly, he said, other than getting the recognition from the clients or the, the, the impression that they agreed or listened to what he had to say, not much. And I thought that that was actually really interesting. If I think back to where I am now and where I came from, I wouldn't be where I am now, obviously, if it wasn't for that legal qualification, but it was being a managing agent that placed me in this position and really taught me most of what I know. So I have to admit that I'm not of the opinion that you need a university uh, or maybe even, you know, college level um, qualification. And if you did, what would that be? Because being a managing agent is needing to know a little about a little bit about engineering and needing to know about financials and needing to know about um, legal and psychology and sociology and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. There isn't enough time in the day to really learn everything that people perceive that you need to know. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. But now, <laughs> would you go? Would you go to a brain surgeon that says, "I have trained on the job. Um, I've cut a couple of brains open, <laughs> some sheep, some pigs, um, and now I'm now I'm trying my hand at humans." Um, it depends so if me... my medical aid will cover it or not. <laughs> so, 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 no, so to that. me, so to, so to me, professionalization means that you need to have a qualification and not necessarily a legal qualification. But we both know, I mean, we've, we've both been on the other side as managing agents as well. Yeah. We both know that you need accounting knowledge. You do need, you do need some engineering knowledge. You do need some legal knowledge. So maybe that qualification, like um, Vita was saying, must be structured in a way that it encompasses all that, all yeah. those different things. Because if you want to have a profession, then the people must be professionally trained. You can't just get anybody Training. from the street and say, all right, you've, you've now sat for six months in the office of somebody that, that knows how to do this. And now suddenly you're good enough and you can start a business and you can be let loose. Vita, yeah. you want to? Really? If, if there's one thing that being a lecturer at the university taught me, it was actually nothing to do with my my subjects that I had to teach, but how education works and how putting curriculums together work and how you register these things. And it's actually fascinating. There were instances where I called it the dark arts, how to do those things. And people actually agreed with me because it's it, it is it's fascinating. And and that is in contrast with my fear that I let people go out of university and they don't know enough because it's exactly what this is what we talk about. And then very clever people say to me, that's why we have um, uh, credits and your degree is made up of credits and each module carries a credit so that you sort of like spread that what they need to know to, to, to walk out and be able to go function. And, and that brings me to what an education does. And, and Hendrik Hoffman will have a good laugh because he was taught, told this next to the pond when with the previous um, NAMA uh, um, function there at Webersburg, where he said to me, he only has a BCom. And I said to him, no, 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 you don't only have a BCom, you have the whole experience of being at the university and how to think about things. 
Yeah. And that's what an education actually does. It gives you a platform and empowers you from there to go and function. Think, think, think of your time when you were an article clerk in the law firm. Yeah, you get to that law firm. I remember the first thing I had to do was go serve papers. And I thought to myself, what does this have to do with law? But all of that shapes up in functioning in your in your firm eventually. So, so in the end, education or a qualification, it's impossible to give you everything that you need to do, but it empowers you to go forth and gain more experience based on the foundation that was laid for you. And that is why, um, for example, with the QCTO specifically, a fairly substantial part of that qualification is practical experience. There's three parts to a QCTO qualification. There's the uh, learning, which is the ordinary lecturing. Then there is the, the part that you do examples and role playing. And then the third part is the fact that you need to get practical experience from a recognized institution. So what, and the other thing that a qualification does is, which is a problem in our industry, is it gives you a benchmark um, where people at least can, and that sounds funny, but people, I ask people, why aren't there more managing agents at the NAMA Bowls Day? And then people tell me uh, because they've, they're worried that they poach each other's um, staff. staff. And I'm like, mm. what? And they said, yeah. So if you, for example, have a qualification in place, Everybody is on equal footing. You can start standardizing salaries and to say, but if you have an NQF4 and you've got three years experience, um, the prescribed salary might be this. This is what is going in the industry and things like that. So a qualification in the end is actually much more than what you physically learn in your classes that you attend, but it's the way you think, the way you approach problems, um, the way, the, the effect it has on the industry to say, okay, but now we are all on the same, um, we, you know, we, we, it's assumed we are all on the same standard. Um, yeah. And that, yeah, that, definitely. That, those are things that, that, that the people in the industry should, should start thinking about. Absolutely. Um, can I, can I, we, we, we still have a lot. So can I, can I, jump a bit forward uh, Vita I think uh, you also earlier um, made a valid comment about um, registration and where should somebody be registered I mean we had that discussion should it be NAMA should it be the PPRA um, how in what type of organization should that registration lie and who should oversee this um, and, and maybe you can give us some of your insights in that regard well, the, the individuals, the what we call in law, the natural persons, have to register with the PPRA and get the registration there to practice. The question now is, what do we do with the entities, the, the managing agents? And they register, they do not have any place to register currently. And that is why I want to explain the importance of a voluntary organization to the audience. Um, the value of a voluntary organization lies in the fact that it illustrates a mentality because voluntary means you don't need to be there. Statutory means you have to be there. You have no choice in it. So if a community comes together and decide to regulate themselves, to take themselves forward, and they do it voluntary, there's actually more power in that. And that's where your numbers come from. And that numbers uh, empowers you to start lobbying government or whoever to, in the end, become statutory and to become more powerful. So it's going to sound like I'm punting Nama, I am a non-executive di director of NAMA, but I am punting the value of NAMA as a voluntary organization, regulating the industry in uh, to, to an extent um, 
at this stage. Part of the research I did for my master's was on strata type, or strata community Australia, SCA. And what I found was that they are actually a voluntary organization. And they became so strong in Australia that it was deemed or it was frowned upon not to be a member of SCA, whether it's voluntary or not, and to appoint a managing agent who was not a member of the SCA, and that's voluntary. So the role that NAMA currently plays, and NAMA is in a difficult position because it sits between two regulatory authorities. It brings me back to my original point that the whole regulatory framework is actually a bit skewed. Um, NAMA is the liaison between the PPRA for individuals, but NAMA is also the li liaison between the CISOs that looks at the um, governance and the dispute resolution. Um, and I know there's, there's, I pick up all kinds of critique towards NAMA, but the moral of the story or the point is that is what we have now. That is an established organization for managing agents. And the more people who join and the bigger the numbers become, the more powerful the organization become and more changes can be effected. And then once you establish yourself as the predominant regulatory, whether voluntary or statutory organization in industry, people will start noticing to say, but if I appoint you as my managing agent, are you a member of NAMA? Because we know if you are a member of NAMA, the next the certain tick boxes needs to be ticked. And therein lies a kind of regulation. So, 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 so if, if, if there's regulation that lies there, um, where does that come from? Does it come from the fact that there's a code of ethics, which you are then voluntarily binding yourself to, or if it's statutory, that there's a statutory code of ethics that you have to act in a certain professional manner. And if you don't, then you can be kicked out of that organization. Is that where it comes from? Um, is, is, is that what actually drives you then to professionalization? Yeah, yeah. in a voluntary organization, it is a, it's, it's, you can call it a social contract where you say, I joined this because there is, um, I want to forward my profession by joining this voluntary organization. I see the value in it. I, if I um, join the voluntary organization, there's certain prerequisites and I then prescribe or uh, under sign their code of conduct. NAMA has a code of conduct, how you should conduct yourself. The problem with the voluntary organization is, is the fact that you do not have um, teeth. Uh, teeth. Uh, you don't have teeth. Yeah. A, a statutory organization has got teeth because there's legislation behind you where you can say, well, you're going to be fined, you're going to be this, you're going to be scrapped from the role. But do you then, not do you not get teeth? And Zerlinda, maybe you can come in here. Do you not get teeth by actually enforcing your code of conduct? Is that not the problem? Yeah. Um, so, should a code of conduct not be enforced? One, yeah. of the, one of the questions on the on the Q and A that popped in is like, does a NAMA, for example, have a code of conduct for its members? And they do. You know, we've been quite fortunate to be working with NAMA on their management agreement, disciplinary code, and code of conduct, and all those fun things. And with a and and I love the the term Vita uses of a social contract in this industry that is so small. We always talk about it as a, a little fishbowl. You know, you are going to adhere to that code of conduct in order to keep the reputation in order to be part of that community because that community is being recognized as the requirement. So you are not going to adhere to that necessarily voluntarily or even know about it unless it is enforced upon you. So yes, I mean, we always say that our legislation doesn't have teeth. So it's interesting to, to talk about having teeth when you, when you are based in statute. It's not impossible to have that teeth when you're based in a voluntary uh, situation either as long as as you said Vili, that code of conduct is there it is agreed to it is acknowledged it is understood it is practiced it is enforced that there is a committee that is enforcing it 
Um, I always say to my clients, when it comes to rules, you can have all the rules in the book, but if you're not going to enforce them, it's not worth the paper that it's written on. So if you're going to have that document, you need to enforce it. It's like telling a child, if you're naughty, I'm going to give you a hiding. If you're naughty, I'm going to give you a hiding, but you never give that kid a hiding. I know yeah. it's not about kids hiding, but you know, case in point, an example, you have to enforce it. So yes, you must apply that code of conduct if you're going to have it. Otherwise, it's not worth it. Okay, um, then also, um, who will be the regulatory body? Um, so so if, I, as, if I understand Vita correct, correctly, then she says one starts with your voluntary organization in respect of the managing agents. You do have a regulatory body in respect of the individuals, that is now the PPRA, um, but in respect of the managing agents, you would then have a voluntary organization uh, unless uh, the statutes are changed and it says, no, this is the, the statutory body that looks after managing agents. And then you need to get licensed. Um, so so um, will you then license that managing agency at the voluntary organization? Um, and, and they then enter into the contract, the social contract with, with the community? Um, or will you now get it from a regulatory body that says you also have to have a license to practice as a managing agent, as your uh, managing agency uh, with the PPRA. Um, what is your, your thinking on that, um, Peter? Really interesting. I, I hear you use the word license. That's typically um, language in the Australian setup where they have to have a license. Um, I don't know if it has changed since I did my dissertation, but at that stage, it was interesting that they sort of like had the same setup as ours. Remember, they have the different states and it differs from state to state, but they had the situation where for managing agents, the, the Strata Community Australia was the predominant um, organization forget now whether it's statutory or voluntary. And then they had to do like we had to do, you also had to get license from the state to practice, but that was more and in a sense also on estate agents. So what one wants to do is uh, NAMA is currently not a recognized professional body in terms of SACWA because we do not have the qualifications developed yet. You can become a recognized professional body, whether it's voluntary or statutory, the moment that you have qualifications on which you base your designations. So the first step would be if we have these qualifications uh, confirmed, NAMA then can proceed to apply to SACWA to become a recognized professional body. And then, uh, that gives a certain state a stature to to the body, even though it's still voluntary, um, to be a recognized professional body with um, with SACWA. What one then can do is uh, you can start with interaction with your banks, with the CSOs, with all other service providers in the industry to say that we are the recognized professional body, we are actually registered, and promote yourself as such, so that there's an awareness as to where to go as a starting point with managing agents. Um, I speak under correction, you, you guys will be in a better position maybe, but I understand that the banks are slowly getting there where they say, um, if we need to finance a new development, is there a managing agent appointed already and, and is the managing agent registered with NAMA? What then is going to happen, the industry is going to be to become the, uh, the teeth, if you understand what I, what I mean. Uh, uh, the industry is going to start regulating itself to say, but I'm a member of NAMA. I went through the effort to get registered there. I pay my dues each year. Why aren't you doing it? 
why, what are you scared of? And I'm going to start to promote myself and NAMA as the professional body to say to my trustees and my scheme people to say, why are you choosing people that's not with the recognized professional body? We have fees. We've got all of this. We've got our code of conduct. Why? Why? What is, what is the problem here? And, and then... And that's what happened in Australia with, with Strata Community Australia, that the pressure of the industry made them into the body that they were in such a way that if you're not with Strata Title Australia, then Strata Community Australia, then, as I've said, you, you frown upon. So, so in that way, the community starts regulating themselves and giving themselves teeth without actually any legislation anywhere. But and, also, and maybe, but also, so if I can, if I can just jump in here, Vita. So also, that organisation will then have to enforce their their code of conduct. Um, so they need to, they need to, and that's my opinion. They need to enforce the code of conduct. They also, in that code of conduct, for example, have to have some oversight into operations, maybe, um, uh, and and require if you want to be a member of this organisation, uh, then you need to have all your trust audits, and I've, I've got it there in my slide, where I say your, your total back of the account audit. Now, we, we've just seen what happened in Rodeport again, where a managing agent has run away with, um, I think it's 19 million rands worth of trust money um, in respect of, of, of that specific agency. Um, and, and they ran a back of trust account, and every trust uh, audit is done on the individual scheme, but there's never a bucket audit on the whole um, whole bucket of, of trust accounts. And, and surely that creates a risk. And if you've got an organization like the NAMA or whomever that might be, then they may say, if you want to be a member, then you will have to have your bucket account audited as a whole as well. And if you don't, then you're no longer a member. Um, isn't that where we should go? That's where Linda, we should what? go. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely where we should go. But, Billy, we can, like Linda said, we can have all the rules and all the things and all the everything in the whole world. It's a mentality thing. The industry needs to decide as a collective, this is where we want to go. And it's actually not NAMA who needs to decide it or the lot of us. The industry needs to decide it and they need to go and become members in mass. And it's not a question of I like NAMA or not or this or that. And it's not a question of what they've done in the past and so forth. It's a question of it is currently recognized. How can we make our industry stronger? Oh, let's use the available vehicle, get involved there and move forward and make the industry. It's a paradigm shift that needs to be made in the industry. And I'm a little bit worried about that because you know I've said this to you on various occasions and now I'm out on a limb. I always, I get the idea that the service providers in the industry, the strata fins and the WeConnect use and the consultants like Zalinda and so forth are more worried about the industry than the people actually in the industry. And, and the way you change that is, it's like, oh, the streets are dirty because there's no um, uh, rubbish being removed. What are we going to do about this? Are we going to wait or we're we going to get in ourselves and start changing what's going on? Can I, can I, can I, can I, yeah, can I yeah, jump. on that? So um, I was worried what you were going to say there, Vita, when you said you're putting yourselves on a limb. And, and at, at first I was like, but then I was like, maybe you're right. But what is different with us is that most of us are not in competition with each other. We support each other and it's easier to do it together than it is to do it alone. And I know I've heard, I've heard people say, oh, I don't want to be part of NAMA because of this. I don't want to be part of NAMA because of this. NAMA are making, and I feel like this webinar is turning into a NAMA debate, but it, it has made, it has made progressive steps to become more all-inclusive and 
it is listening to its members. And yes, the, the cogs of change are very slow, but isn't it everywhere? But you are 100% right. If we as an industry as a whole, service providers, managing agents, owners, trustees, you name it, want the industry to change, we all have to use the available vehicle. And if we don't want to use that available vehicle, then go and start your own vehicle. There's nothing wrong with that either. But unless we all stand together with the same mindset or similar mindset, there isn't going to be a change. Um, and it has been amazing. And I'm sure that you can all agree over the last few years that our environment has forced us together to support each other. I mean, that sectional title living group of Hendrix, I, I joined it when it was 2,000 pages. Yeah. Yeah. And it's now sitting at, what, 20,000 almost over such a short period of time. And it's not nonsense people that are there. It's not Mickey Mouse and, and Donald Duck. It is real owners, trustees, managing agents, attorneys, you name it. Gary's group has, has grown. There is a willingness, a, a desire to work together. I go to the NAMA events and the breakfast and the expos and all that fun stuff. And where I would normally see ABC standing together, XYZ standing together, they're all together. They're all talking to each other. It's it's absolutely amazing. So so so, so I want to jump in here because that's exactly the point. I mean, if you think how, for, for example, Alistair. I mean, how we we all chat to Alistair, make him part of the 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 conversation out there. Um, so you get industry collaboration. We bring other industries in. Um, the Dylan Year shops from the legal industry, the engineering guys, Aubrey, and all those guys. So we need to have collaboration between all these industries. Um, and I think that's the next point that I that I had to make. And you, you make it so well. So it sounds like a NAMA discussion. And the only reason is NAMA is what we have. So we, we can give it a name. But yeah. if if I if I have one message, it is. Ach, and isn't it the message of this country in the end of the day? Um, Solidarity has the slogan that says, we will do it ourselves. Um, I think that is what we, that's my message for the day is to get involved so that the managing agents who's willing and able is distinguished from the ones who resist change and who doesn't want to, 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 to uh, do things this proper way because they are pulling the industry down. And the only way we're going to do it is to get involved and to participate. And it's like Willie really said, everybody, everybody must get involved because it's in any case, only the ones involved in the industry that actually understands the, in, the industry. That's the other thing. Try explaining this industry to somebody who doesn't know how this works. It's, it's, it's it's fair. So, so the next step is the next step is public awareness. I mean, that's what you yes. guys are saying. We need to we meet, need to make everybody aware. We need to make the public aware. So we must use platforms like Sectional Title Living South Africa. Zerlinda, you didn't mention your pla platform, Homeowners Association South Africa. So so platforms like that. We need to make use of CSOS. We need to make use of the PPRA, radio, TV ads, all those things. We actually need to let people understand what the industry is about, um, what the rules are. Yes, we shouldn't fixate on the rules only. We should fixate on proper management. But those things are important because it's important for people to understand their rights and obligations in schemes. Zerlinda, what do you think? Nicole Tavares reminded me of our neighborhood as well. It's also exactly. Sorry, I didn't put it on there. <laughs> <laughs> I keep on forgetting too because it's still new. Um, you know, I, I also want to say, and, and and I have to admit that the, the bulk of my work comes from managing agents because the, the bulk of my clients are body corporates and homeowners associations, not as much owners and, and tenants and things like that. But even reading through the, the Q&A that has been posted, um, there's still this whole reprimanding element, you know, like, um, uh, my managing agent is doing this, my managing agent doesn't want me to do this, my managing agent, my managing agent, my managing agent. The trustees also need the fingers pointed at them. The members need the fingers pointed at them. And, you know, when I was a, a managing agent, yes, I had my BA, LLB, LLM, la, 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 all that nonsense behind my name that gave me a little bit of, you know, the upper hand. 
but I was still treated really poorly in some instances. And that made me feel, you know what, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm just going to shut up and do your minutes. You know, if, if you're not going to take my value that I have to add, then I'm not even going to try to add it. And a lot of my managing agent colleagues that I chat to, they want to be more vocal. They want to be trained. They want to be educated, but they're constantly being hit down. It's almost like owners and trustees and other people in the industry are saying, you know, what do you know? Stay in your box. But at the same time, they want them to be at a higher level. Um, so it's not just the managing agents that need to do something. It is the owners and the tenants and the trustees. And that's where NAMA comes in great as well. NAMA are open to owners and trustees attending their, um, their functions. There are a couple of managing agents that always make sure that the invitation is sent to the owners and trustees. But very often the owners and trustees say, oh, it's not my obligation. Oh, I'm working. Oh, it's during working hours. Oh, there's a fee that I need to pay for it. Or my favorites, that's what I pay my managing agent for. So there needs to be a complete change of mindset and it doesn't just start and end with the managing agents um you know but it's a good start that, I, that, I also think i also think sorry vita i just want to quickly make this point i also think that there needs to be legislative changes um because we're standing in the situation of master and servant where the managing agent is the servant of the scheme and the trustees are the executives that then gives these instructions and I think that relationship needs to be changed and that should be a professional contract. So a managing agent should stand in the same situation that an attorney stands with his client, that a doctor stands with his patient, that an engineer stands with his, um, with the, the people that he's uh, de developing or um, drawing or whatever the situation is um, in respect of what he's doing. So that situation or that contractual, contractual relationship needs to change. And it needs to become a professional relationship where that managing agent then has a fiduciary duty to do the right thing. Because I've said it on many webinars that the, the, the managing agents stand between the devil and the deep blue sea. If they, if they don't do what the trustees tell them, then they get fired. Um, mm -hmm. And if they, if they um, go back to the, um, to the owners, then, or if they don't do it, then the owners say, but the managing agent is not doing their job properly. But they must choose between their business and acting in the correct fashion. And at the end of the day, if you're a business person and you've got 20, 30 people working for you and you, your, your business is at risk, you, you're going to do what they tell you to do. And then you're going to say, well, I'm, I'm just the guy that do what they tell me to do. And, and that's the excuse that we all hear. Um, yep. so, so that relationship needs to change and that needs to come from the legislator. And then, like we said, they must be, be members of the regulatory body. They must be members of the professional body. Um, and then I've had the other one. Trustees needs to be trained and there must be compulsory education in the, in the industry con continuously. I mean, people must continuously, um, continuously be educated. Billy, two things. One on what you said, one on what Sir Linda said. I, I think we're running out of time. First of all, these things that you talked about just now are crucial. But how do we accomplish that? It's good old-fashioned numbers game. If your collective becomes big enough, that's how the quantity surveyors manage to get legislation for quantity surveyors. That's how the architects manage to get legislation for them. That's how the Engineering Council managed to get statutory regulation for engineers. It was those voluntary voluntary bodies that became such, such a crucial um, institution that they had enough power behind them to start lobbying to have these changes effected. In my mind, the whole section of title industry needs to be reimagined in a sense. Um, that's a story for a different day. It's about an a, 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 a inauguration lecture that I attended for a full prof about regeneration. And, and that's where we need to get to. So that's a numbers game. And then, so Linda, on that, what you said about trustees and owners and occupiers, that famous nuts and bolts course that I put yeah. together. Yeah. Um, that course was specifically put together for owners and trustees yeah. with the golden thread going through that course, first of all, to understand why certain things are done in a certain way, 
And secondly, to make owners, occupiers, and trustees of sectional title understand that it's not the question of them and us. It's we. And in, in that way, if, if you can have an owner, occupier, and a trustee understand it's a we thing, that's supposed to make life easier for your managing agent as well. So if anybody wondered what my thoughts were behind nuts and bolts and what actually distinguish it from many of the other courses is it's it's to explain specifically to trustees, owners and occupiers what it is that I live in and why I do things a certain way. Because I'm of the opinion if they start understanding the why, they might stop doing certain things and being constantly in that uh, adversarial uh, situation with your managing agent and with whoever else and to say but okay but these people are not being obnoxious it's actually there's a reason for all of this we're running out of time guys um there was two more points that i wanted to make i mean if you are um if you are a professional then obviously you're going to have a professional indemnity insurance in place so a scheme is then much more protected than when there's not not um, professional indemnity insurance, and we've seen in the in the legislation now that that is required. So we are moving. We do have small steps that are we that we are taking towards professionalisation, but that obviously is one of the th things that has to happen. And then the last thing that I wanted to say that I think also is important is that that professionals embrace technology. Yep. Um, and, and we've got awesome technology um, in, in the country. I mean, we've got We Connect, we've got BCM Track, we've got Red Rabbit, we've got um, Meeting Pal, we've got Imperium, we've got Zerlinda's um, neighborhood that's, that's all there. <laughs> So, so, so all those things are there, um, and 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 people should embrace that, and and that's how we th how we move forward, and and having conversations like this. I mean, if we don't have conversations like this, we're not going to get people to to start and and getting like-minded people together. Then we're not going to get people that starts moving in mass to actually to to professionalize the industry. Yeah, definitely. Regarding the questions, guys, um, we, we say that any questions, put it on the Q&A. Um, we're definitely not going to have time. We already passed our time. So what we will do is I'll ask um, Vita and Zerlinda um, to, uh, to, to answer, and, and I'll also answer as far as we can. But can I give um, Zerlinda, give you one minute, and Vita, one minute uh, to, to end, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. You know, I yeah, but between us, there's a there's a lot of a lot of colleagues that we that we work with and that we support, and I really am seeing that in the management space as well. And if we as an industry can support each other, I don't see why owners and trustees cannot support their managing agents either. Yes, there are a couple of naughty managing agents, and yes, they are due to be punished, which is where the code of conduct and the the disciplinary code and the enforcement and the fines and the penalties and the just general shunning from the from the industry happens, you know, the name and shame and all of those fun things. But um, this this industry wouldn't be the industry that it was that it is without managing agents. They are the backbone of it, and they take a hell of a lot of strain and brunt. Um, and I do believe that they deserve all of the benefits that that should be coming to them. And I don't want to say that education is you know the lowest thing on the list, but I still believe that it is the industry that needs to support them. And then that that positivity is going to want them and make them desirous to do more education and qualifications and all of those fun things. It mustn't be a, a, a mandatory requirements on a very high level. Um, lower level NQF, NQ5, I think what you're describing, Vita, the community scheme manager, is exactly where it should be. I'm very, very excited to, to see that. But um, yeah, I think we could talk for, for ages, but thank you so much, Billy, for the opportunity. And the other training course, um, not to forget, other than the nuts and bolts, is Stratofin's trustee training. I mean, that has been written by one of the highest qualified sectional title experts in the country and is incredibly valuable and is free, uh, which a lot of these <laughs> you know resources are. <laughs> Vita? Uh, Billy? I'm 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 coming in from a little bit more of a philosophical side here um, to say that communities 
will become the backbone of this country. Um, where we need to rely on our closest neighbor. And your sectional title scheme where you live in is your first community that you're in and then your greater neighborhood that you're in. And um, people should start thinking about it in that way to understand, but I actually live in a community. It's not just a word, that's where I live. And maybe I should apply myself in that way. And then secondly, to quote Solidarität, we must do this ourselves. If managing agents wants to change their lives, they will have to come to the party and understand that they will do it, that they have to do it themselves. Nobody else is going to do it for them. NAMA can help, but NAMA is as strong as the numbers. Um, and, and, and that's actually my message, that, that paradigm shift to understand if we want to change this, we need to change the illness. We do not need, it doesn't help looking at the symptoms. We need to look at the origin of our illness and we need to treat it there. Thank you so, for the opportunity. It was it was uh, uh, very nice um, doing this while I'm on holiday. Um, <laughs> it but it was, Thank you so much. It was absolutely worthwhile. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The last thing that I want to say is, uh, and where this whole conversation started, is uh, about remuneration and, and the paying of professional um, fees to managing agents. Um, and to me, it is a chicken and egg situation. You cannot ask for a professional fee until you are a professional. So I think the start is to professionalize. And then once we have done that, we will see that there's a shift away from this trying to undercut each other in respect of fees because people will then understand the value that the managing agent brings yes. to the scheme. And once they understand the value that, that is brought by that managing agent, they will be happy to remunerate them properly. Um, and, and I think that is where we need to go. We need to yep. change this, the industry by becoming professionals and then we will be entitled or get the money that, that people are entitled to, to be paid because people are entitled to be paid properly for what they are doing because they're working bloody hard um, in respect of schemes and they're not getting paid. If I read the stuff on sectional title living South Africa and some people say, oh, no, that is too much because I, I at some stage said that people, managing agents should be paid not less than 250 rand per unit per month. And I was jumped on by various people um <laughs> but but the, the the amount of work that that managing agents put in there is just enormous but they need to professionalize and once they've done that they will be able to get the money thanks ladies and gentlemen for joining us today um regarding the questions we will answer those and send those through to you thank you so much thank you Strata. thank you thank you